All righty, everybody. Welcome back to another great session. We have this session is titled "What What's Next in Open Source Firmware." We have Ron, Daniel, Mario, Gene, and Hong. Take it away. Okay, thank you, Sean. Uh, uh, yes, so uh, again, welcome to uh, What Next with uh, Open Source uh, Firmware. I just want to give a little bit of uh, the background why I have, are we having this session here today. Um, let me first begin with uh, a personal introduction of all the people we have here. Mario Belling. Um, I met Mario back in 2007. I think uh, that was the first time I learned about open source. So Mario was like very, my very first uh, mentor. In 2009, we started the Force Asia organization together and have been, has been uh, working together since then. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I could say about Mario, uh, I think uh, he is a doer. So he make a lot of things happen and uh, he has a lot of experience in uh, scaling open source project. Yeah. And uh, for Mario, I also um, get to know the amazing Daniel Malowski. So Daniel is a ve um, very active uh, open source developer. He has been contributing to a lot, a lot of open source uh, projects. I, I can't even name them all. But um, uh, yeah, he's very knowledgeable at the same time, very modest. He often refers himself as a firmware hobbyist, but to me, he, he is an ex expert in, uh, in many aspects. Uh, we regularly meet at uh, conferences, like several times at the Force HR Summit. We, we were in Force Dump together, we went to the CCC together. And um, Daniel currently leading the firmware development um, in the Pocket Science Lab projects, and we got to meet again on a weekly basis. Yeah, what I really love about the open source community, you get to meet a lot of interesting people, and from these interesting people, you get to meet more interesting people. So Daniel uh, brought us together uh, with Ron. So, um, Gon um, Minik, uh, as you know, so he is the original author of Core Boot, yeah, the Linux uh, BIOS, and he's been writing firmware for over 40 years. I believe that it's really difficult to find a better person who can speak about firmware. We are very lucky to have Ron here with us today. And from Daniel, I also uh, got to know um, Jean Marie uh, Verdun. Yeah, so what I heard, I'm not sure if it's true, maybe you can correct. So John has a special relationship with computers. Yeah, he in love with them. He's been <laughs> spending a lot of time designing them on the hardware level. Yeah, and uh, welcome, John. Very happy to have you here. So what brought us all here today? I just want to share quickly the story. Uh, I was listening to their conversation about Plan 9 and a, a few other firmware topics at the weekly open source hardware meeting organized by Force Asia. So it is like a public uh, meeting happening every Saturday at 5 p.m. in the Central Europe time where invited people who currently working on open source hardware come together. Yeah. And uh, I find the conversation super interesting. And I think that um, open source firmware and hardware should get more weight in the ecosystem. So we should talk more about it. If we really want to, to achieve open source in all the layers and what we some of us discussed yesterday. That is the reason why I invited them to have their conversation that they normally have among themselves here at Say It Resort to have a conversation in front of us. I believe that we can learn a lot from this conversation. At the same time, I want to see if we can have work together and bring open source firmware and hardware into the mainstream. So. That is my job. I introduce everyone, and now I would like to have um, Mario, Daniel, Sean, and Ron. The stage is yours. Well, thank you very much. That is a, a very nice uh, wrap up, and uh, um, you can also read uh, more about the backgrounds of everyone. Um, 
on uh, the schedule. Um, so uh, we really have a nice panel here with um, a lot of background. And uh, when we uh, put together uh, like the topic of firmware, we actually came uh, up with more and more questions. So I don't know if we can answer all of these questions that we have <laughs> like listed in the preparation of this talk, but um, I think we can give a few insights. So um, my idea was this, um, um, I would really like uh, um, if we could start to share um, a bit more, where are we coming from? Because if we want to talk about where we are heading, what's the future of open firmware, we should also understand a bit what's the um, past, what um, is our personal motivation and uh, um, yeah, what's the presence and then not just where we are heading, but where we want to head. Where is, what's the future we want? So um, um, I would like to ask uh, Ron to start because Ron, you, you I, I don't know because uh, um, you, you look very young to me, but Hong Fook just said that you have many years of, of background. And if you could tell us a bit, how did you get um, to, uh, into uh, um, a film where, how did you start Core Boot? Uh, a few backgrounds and uh, yeah, I, and maybe also point us to where we can find more information um, because we just have around uh, um, like 45 minutes here. So please, Ron. How did it all start? Yeah, um, so I won't do 45 years, <laughs> starting when I was a teenager, I guess. But the um, Linux BIOS in 1999, uh, we had built a supercomputer at Los Alamos. And the boot time experience was so terrible because it was an American Megatrends BIOS. And I had just gotten off a project where I designed a PCI card and realized that now that all the hardware was self, you could discover the hardware just by enumerating it with the config space. That meant that we no longer had dip switches and little special things. And so it seemed that me being, I actually am a kernel guy who occasionally has to get into firmware because the firmware is so awful that we ought to be able to embed a Linux kernel in Flash and have Linux be the BIOS, not the crappy firmware that was in there. So. Um, Starting in 1999, we built systems where 100% of the bytes in firmware were derived from GPL code. As of today, on x86, it's more like about 6% if you get a Chromebook. Most of the bytes in firmware are locked down owned by um, actually Intel at this point uh, or, or the vendor. But in any event, there's a really old book by uh, the guy who invented hypertext called Computer Lib that was very popular in the 70s. And the thrust, the central thrust of that book was, we need to own our machines. So when we get a machine, we need to own it. And that means we need to own it from the first instruction after power on reset, up through whatever kernel we run, up through whatever programs we run. So that's kind of been the, the um, focus of my life almost, which is open source the firmware, open source the kernel. And now with the Uroot project, which is all the user land written in Go, try to build a user land that's understandable because uh, I, you know, libc is a wonderful thing, I guess, but I can't understand it. And the GNU bin is a big, wonderful thing, but I can't understand it. So I think the big focus of my life anyway has been open source such that you can understand everything that's going on when you use a computer. So that's why. Wow, and um, so supercomputers, I think that's also um, a connection to Jean-Marie. Jean-Marie, uh, um, uh, you have been uh, working with supercomputers. You even uh, uh, created a startup um, in uh, French, which is successfully sold. And uh, now you work in with HPE. And um, so what, what, is, what was the start for you to really uh, um, yeah, start working here with uh, open source firmware or like with this deep level of technology? Okay, as crazy as it could look like, so I, I have been hit by the same issue than Ron back in the 90s when I was working for CEA. So that was not Los Alamos, but CEA is the same kind of activities in Europe, in France. And um, I was designing supercomputers for them. So this, is, this was at the period of time where they were switching from um, vector technology to superscalar technology. So to the alpha microprocessors. 
And um, the boot time of the system was just a nightmare. And um, this is when I've been starting to be involved into firmware development, trying to understand why we had the fastest, fastest CPU in the world with the slowest boot time in the world. So it was a little bit crazy to me, and I tried to understand what, what was going on. So um, we, we deployed that supercomputers, but the, um, the boot time was, just to give a rough idea, the boot time was about a day. So just imagine you turn on your computer in the morning, and you have to wait up to the evening just to, to log in. So th th this was this kind of nightmare we were facing with this machine. And when you crashed the system, so you had to wait another day just to apply the patch and being sure that the system boots. <laughs> so and it, it was really, really a big mess. And we tried to improve the firmware at that time. So then I created my own company, uh, which was designing computers in Europe. And um, I, did, I didn't want it to pay a crazy amount of money for firmware development. So that's why we relied on open source technology. And uh, back in 2010, I started to be involved with an open hardware community, trying to understand how we can share um, better uh, our design files and how, how could we extend the life cycle of systems. So that's the beauty of open hardware because we are sharing schematics so anybody around the world can fix issues with the hardware. And um, within the OCP communities, nobody w w was really keen to look at what's going on regarding firmware. So most of the time, hardware designers are focused on hardware. They do not care about software. And uh, operating system um, designers do not care about the firmware. So that, there's uh, something in the middle that uh, uh, doesn't passionate people. And, um, and I, I've been hit by a stupid thing, which was to refurbish some servers for some customers. And th these people wanted to use NVMe drives. And the system BIOS coming up with the OCP hardware was not able to properly boot on NVMe because uh, it was too old and it was not integrated and the UFI driver was buggy and didn't work properly in the systems. And I started to say, this is messy and this, this reminds me of the issues I faced in the past with firmware. So we need to fix that. And I met back with the core boot communities and Ron telling him, hey, can we find a way to, to fix all of this crap? And um, and we ended up to start working on Linux boot all together. And um, by the way, I've been successful to boot that machine on the, with the NVMe drive, and the customer is super happy about it now. So, and so yes, thank you very much. And I see uh, Ron is nodding, so uh, absolutely <laughs> understanding these issues. Uh, before we go a little bit more into the topic of firmware and open hardware and how these are connected, um, I want to learn, like Daniel, how did you actually uh, meet uh, Jean-Marie and Ron? Uh, how did this connection start? And what's your background, of course, personally also? How did you get into open source firmware? Yeah, so that's also quite a long journey, actually, although I guess I'm the youngest here. Uh, so a friend of mine, uh, which is in the ha uh, same hackerspace as I am, uh, that would be Philip. Uh, Philip founded the Open Source Firmware Conference at some point, and he was working on firmware, and I had actually no clue about it. I was always fascinated a bit about microcontrollers when we had them in university. Uh, but I mean, we were just playing around, sort of. Uh, but at some point, I was uh, getting more and more curious, and Philip uh, showed me the x86 side of things, so from microcontrollers to actual microprocessors. And then over time, I discovered more and more, and well, I can tell you, it's a very, very deep rabbit hole there. And that's where eventually then I met Ron at one of the uh, conferences, actually, and also Jean-Marie later on. And yeah, now we're working together on all sorts of things. Hey, cool. And uh, Daniel, uh, um, what is uh, uh, the relationship here um, between uh, firmware and and uh, open hardware? Um, we we heard like uh, uh, firmware, okay, like. Uh, long booting times of like a day. This is like unimaginable today. Um, so uh, is the story very simple that, uh, um, uh, you know, like people thought like uh, we can't only do firmware, we also have to do hardware uh, in order to really solve it. Or um, can you like introduce us a bit into uh, this area? Yeah, so one person uh, once said, uh, but I haven't heard it myself, I only know the citation, that if you really care about software, you would need to create your own hardware. Uh, 
And I think uh, Steve Jobs himself even cited that at uh, one of the events where he was introducing the iPhone. Um, but yeah, that's that's one thing. The other thing is there is only very, very few people who actually create hardware. And it only makes sense if many people buy it, right? Because it's quite a lot you would need to do to create hardware, actually. But then on the other end, hardware doesn't work without firmware. And then if you ask people who buy the hardware, they have very, very different ideas and needs, what they want to do with it or, you know, how they, I don't know, want to secure it, for example. So I also have a security background and there we have, uh, well, <laughs> sometimes surprises just because we don't know some certain things and we discover them at some point. And that's uh, where I personally also started digging deeper and uh, looking into potential issues that we have with uh, hardware and firmware playing together. Yeah. Mario, you're muted. You're muted. Sorry, so I, I unmuted. So, Jean-Marie, you brought up this topic, but like, let's say from a standard consumer point of view, yeah, I look at hardware and I think that's hardware and I buy it and yeah, okay. So many people are often not aware that there's software running on it and even a layer of firmware. So um, uh, this is actually uh, uh, pretty exciting. And um, so how is this how could we like describe this to people like uh, uh, what what is the film we're doing and then why is it even possible i mean like if i talk to really deep hardware developers they say actually the lines between software and hardware they are starting to be blurry more and more and then we now have tools like keycat and other cat programs and i know that you're working with them um, and maybe like you could also uh, yeah Describe us a bit. Uh, how, what what is what's going on here? Okay, um, so I've been involved in open hardware community for probably not the past ten years, but seven to eight years. And one of the challenge when you think about open hardware is how do you design these these things and how do you make it really open? And um, this is the exact same um, uh, issue than when open source software started. So. We, we are using uh, on a daily um, task tools, which are pretty common, like compilers, debuggers, all of these kind of things. But when you think about open hardware, there is no three accessible tools just to build up that things. So that's why I got involved into FreeCAD and KiCAD, just to try to provide the tools to build up open hardware. And uh, th there is a lot of involvement uh, and, and a lot of, uh, of work to be done in this area. So now when speaking about hardware and what is the firmware, so I think we can, we can think about it um, like, um, like a Lego. So the, the hardware is not a single piece. So when you look at a motherboard, there's a lot of various chips, a lot of various functions, a lot of various components to interconnect together. And we have to keep in that in mind that all of these components doesn't know each other and they have to find a way to talk to each other and to set them up properly at the right time. So the, soft, uh, the firmware is roughly the software, which is the glue between the Lego brick, which is the uh, hardware component from the motherboard and which is just trying to build up something which is coherent and, and ready to be used by an end users. So that, that, that is really a mandatory step within the boot process of the systems, which is creating um, something powerful or a piece of crap in some way. <laughs> Okay, so um, uh, Ron, we, we already had the chance to learn from you um, about like current trends and, and uh, your work in different projects um, at a number of open hardware meetings um, um, that we are running on uh, every Saturday. Um, so um, it seems like um, this interest uh, in hardware is, it's, uh, and, and firmware, it's, it's really growing. So um, we have more and more people often dropping by and so there's um, also like more activity going on. And uh, um, the question here is, as more and more people getting into uh, hardware and chip development, what approach should modern firmware developers follow today? And I know it's also a bit of a philosophical question um, because when Unix was created, it had simplicity in mind. So what would you recommend uh, um, like uh, developers what approach should they do and what would you like to share about your own projects um, 
what different approaches exist here? Yeah, that, I love that question. So um, I started a new project called Orboot, which is a downstream fork of Coreboot, but all our code is written in Rust. And at some point I realized as I was doing the work that I had, it, it's very easy to fall into the kernel trap. And, and the kernel trap is to decide that your firmware is actually kind of a kernel. That's what happened to UEFI. That's why UEFI has a web server built in. That's why it has, you know, all this stuff built in. That's why it's actually a, a full up operating system in its own right, but even as applications. So the most important thing that firmware can do is get out of the way, um, do as little as it possibly needs to do to make the, the platform ready for something like Linux or Plan 9. Uh, but it should be a very, very thin shim that does as little as possible. And the thing that it should never become, which again is what's happened with UEFI, it should never become an end in itself. So this is why I actually don't even like to think about myself as a firmware guy. I'm actually a kernel guy who you know has to write firmware occasionally because what's there is so terrible. Uh, case in point again, in my view, being UEFI. So the Avoid the kernel trap, right? Don't start thinking in terms of, oh, I'm going to do all these wonderful abstractions. And here's where Rust is good about this because the whole focus of Rust is do everything you possibly can at compile time. And we're finding in Orboot, we can actually know the size our stack is going to be. The maximum size of our call stack because of how Rust works. This is like a, you know, moving 20, literally, you know, 50 years actually beyond C. Um, but that also helps you avoid the kernel trap, right? Don't don't think of firmware as a kernel. Think of firmware as an unpleasant thing that is there just long enough to get things just far enough for Linux to run. That's really a key key idea in my point of view. Okay, and uh, um, so I would like to the three of you to pose a question now here. So how does um, the hardware development, uh, then if we um, talk about hardware and firmware, how does this development direct firmware developers in a specific uh, direction? For example, uh, um, we have a small uh, project, the Pocket Science Lab um, in the FOSS Asia community. And um, there's always this question like, where do you want to uh, implement, for example, a feature? Should it be on the firmware level? Should it be um, on the level of a Python library that's run separately? And I think there are many more questions. And um, so what would you, um, three of you, I mean, would you um, agree on, a, on one direction or what, what, what's your opinion? Who would like to go first? I can start with that. So I guess I'm very much in line with uh, what Ron was saying. So I personally would like to have most control of the platform from the side of my operating system or even my user space, actually. Right. So, so my day job is actually web development. And what I'm doing today is we are building applications that can run in your web browser and they can run almost autonomously nowadays, right? So even if you lose your connection, so like if you're in a tunnel while uh, you know traveling in a train or something, most of the apps that we have today, or uh, many of them, can still operate to some degree because of data that is in a cache or something like that. And when I'm looking at applications that are running on my desktop, I would like to have a very similar experience. So I would be I would be really happy if I could do almost everything or even more than everything on my platform uh, without any restrictions that I could have because, you know, something is not uh, I don't know, not set up properly or something like that. So in that sense, I actually rely on firmware on uh, that layer, but that should really be it. Then I want to be able to do everything I want, right? And if if we speak about Linux, for example, uh, that's actually what it's about for many, many people who are running it. So they don't want to have like a pre-made environment where they can only do what the vendor wants them to do, but they can do everything and, you know, extend or modify it as they like. Hey, can I jump in real quick? Um, I, I want to offer up a warning before I forget. Um, 
So Jean-Marie's company did this really neat thing, which was to take these 2012 era Facebook nodes, you know, refurb them, set them up, resell them. They're wonderful, right? They're a fantastic deal. Um, that worked because on those machines, you could take the flash part out, put in a new one that you program, right? Work fine. Um, we are living in a fool's paradise right now because many servers post about 2018, if you change one bit, one bit of the firmware, right? And my old, my just because it's easy, one of my standard things is change the string del to some other word, if you can guess what it is. Um, you change one bit and a machine won't boot. So we've all lived in a world for the past, I don't know how many years, where if you could figure out what to do, you could take that firmware and replace it with, with different firmware and that would work. Starting in another year or two, you're gonna find yourself buying old servers or old computers and you're gonna wanna change the firmware on, and this is on x86, mind you, and you're not gonna be able to do it. You won't be able to change one bit, literally one bit, without breaking the machine. So why is that? It's because that firmware has a signing key that's enforced in hardware. The owner of that signing key is the company that created that system. They have the key you don't. They won't give you the key because that key is the same key for millions and millions of systems. If they give you the key, that means they've compromised all the other systems they've sold. So we live in a world in the x86 space where the owner of the system is actually not you. It's the company that made the machine. You, so you can't take your machine and sell it to someone. You can't take your machine and change one bit of firmware. It's like owning a car with the, with the hood welded shut so you can't ever see the engine. And this is kind of why I'm, I'm thinking the open source community. I'm not speaking for anyone but the open source community. Um, I think we really need to start thinking about the escape plan from the x86 world now because it's, it's just going to be another few years you'll buy a used machine and discover there's very very little you can do with it unlike what you can do with the kind of servers that jean marie's former company sells so just something to keep in mind i just wanted to get that warning out there it really is a problem i mean that's a really horrible thing ron that's uh, uh, i don't know if people are aware um, uh, what a shocking uh, information that is um, so, um, uh, basically, like, you know, our, our whole idea, like people look on, on the web level on many different levels and they have this idea that we now have like open source, uh, free and open source everywhere and it's kind of mainstream, but actually we are entirely blocked uh, by this level and we won't be able to, to use this. So how uh, aware is uh, the community and actually the public, it, in my view, it would concern everyone because there's so many devices out there everywhere. So how aware are people? What is your experience? Nobody has a clue. I th uh, yeah, I think uh, right very today. few people are aware about these challenges. Um, but as you mentioned, I'm working at HPE right now. So the um, HPE engineering is well aware about that situation and the complexity to find the right balance between security because the, um, the, the key that Ron spoke about um, is driven um, around how do we improve the security of a systems because um, most of software can be hacked, whatever happens. So there's always bugs and there, there might be uh, human, um, uh, human failures when, when the code has been written. And um, so finding the right balance between what, what the end user is expecting from his systems to be um, highly secure and the, uh, the flexibility to reprogram the systems is something which is super complex. So what happened into this industry, especially at the x86 level, is that the whole industry tried to secure as fast as possible the x86 platforms without thinking about the flexibility side. And uh, this has created um, a couple of generation of platforms uh, which are secure, but are really unflexible. And that, that, is, that is part of the current challenge of the industry. We are trying to address it currently, and this is, this is a very complex engineering issue. Um, I think uh, within the next couple of, I should say years, unfortunately, this issue is going to be addressed on x86. Um, but um, th this is still 
super challenging. So that's a, that, that's a key point. So we, we have some workaround which might be coming up for uh, for HP servers within the next couple of quarters, uh, just to keep the, the open source community um, being able to code on, on, on our platform. Uh, and that's also why I, I joined uh, HP, just to warn them about um, the challenge uh, that the x86 industry is facing regarding open source technology and how, how can we embrace that. So luckily, some, some of the projects that the community has, uh, has created are adopted at scale. So we should mention that, and this is also helping. So open, open source and users must be proud about what they what they are doing and should be uh, shot them to their suppliers about, uh, hey, by the way, I want to use an open source firmware on my platform, like open DMC, even if we do not like it or not, uh, or Linux boot, and or uh, any other options like core boot or UBMC. There's plenty of different open source firmware projects around the world. And, and we should be reporting to all suppliers, we need these tools to be able to run on our platforms. This is going to put some pressure on the suppliers. And when there is demand and there is an issue, most of the time the industry react and we, we are able to fix them. But I agree with Ron. So um, the security trend within the industry has created some technologies which are really not flexible. And we, we should be caring about this. So I, I think you raise a number of important uh, questions and issues here. And uh, one issue that I would also um, like to ask you a bit more about is the um, topic of um, um, yeah, security. So um, like sometimes like we hear like stories and even it's sometimes a topic in the uh, US-China trade war where they say, oh yeah, um, on the Chinese hardware on Huawei or somewhere there, there's some firmware running or there's some like code running on the chip and uh, it's it's spying on US citizens. But like um, in, in general, like maybe you could shed some light on this, um, what's really like possible here. And I know this is also a discussion in Europe, where we uh, talk about digital sovereignty um, and in a broader uh, um, yeah, way. And so the question is really like, uh, um, it's a topic on a national level or on a pan-national level, but it's also a topic for the um, security of people and companies. So um, what is really uh, yeah, going on here? What is, what is true? What is fiction? And uh, generally here, there's a question, how can we ensure devices are run securely and adhere to the user's privacy on each layer? Okay, um, let me jump in first and g g give the opportunity to my colleague to speak about it. So, um, the, I am a European citizen. I'm currently living in the US and I can see two different approach regarding security. And that, that, that is really true. And this is also creating the, the, the messy situation into which we are currently. So in the US, the security is offloaded to the supplier. So it means that most of the customers doesn't want to hear about security. So he wants to have a system which is secure. And the, the, the person who is responsible to deliver that security is the supplier. So in Europe, we have a slightly different approach. So we do not trust people. We say, um, my security threat model is based on the fact that I want to know what's going on inside the systems. So if you want to provide me a secure system, prove me it is secure or give me access to the source code of the, of the software which is running on top of your hardware. So uh, in that approach, either you provide your um, proprietary firmware source code to uh, the regulation agencies, or you are using open source firmware. So this is creating an opportunity for open source firmware because the source code is, um, is available. Um, the challenge is to try to bridge the gap uh, between both worlds because suppliers are mostly worldwide company currently, unfortunately. There's no, not that many local suppliers anymore. So either the suppliers is coming from Asia, 
and uh, th there are OGMs or there are US-based companies. There, there are a few European companies, but they are even trying to become worldwide suppliers. So, and, and when you are a company like HPE and you try to supply the same systems around the world, um, this is just creating um, another messy situation regarding what kind of um, security model do we have to address and how do we, do, 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 do we provide um, the right solution. So, um, this is the world we are into currently, and, and this is also explaining um, all of this complexity. I'm, I'm more a big fan about um, having security through transparency instead of secrecy. So that, that is also why I'm pushing for open source firmware approach. And I think the flexibility will be higher. And when you look at the operating systems and what happened in the past regarding Unix and Linux, so the open source model has been pretty efficient at uh, delivering secure systems. So, and if we apply the same models to the firmware world, so we, I'm pretty sure we can deliver a um, highly secure uh, firmware stack using open source uh, models. So that's that's also um, the, the key things. So now I don't know if Ron or Daniel wants to add some uh, um, more relevant comment to that specific topics. I, yeah. I just, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Feel free to jump in. I thought there's always a small delay, but like, just go ahead. All right. And I'm worried about cutting off Daniel again, but I just want to mention three things. Um, I threw in the links, opentitan.org. Oh, so first off, jean is fighting a good fight and really moving the world forward in a good way on um, this issue that I mentioned, ownership. The end user owns the machine, not the, the company that made it. Um, so Open Titan is this, what we call Silicon Root of Trust. I know I work for Google and it's and it's been started by Google, but I think it's really good. It's really fine work and is worth learning from. Um, Chromebooks actually implement the world we want to live in. When you get a Chromebook, it has keys that were installed by Google. And I, it's funny, I keep telling people this and, and it's just not widely known for some reason. You can change those keys. And the talk that I linked to at Linux uh, Containers Europe 2016, uh, in that talk, I described how you can build your own version of Chrome OS. You can build your own signing key for it. You can put your own keys into the Chromebooks such that they will no longer trust Google's built Chrome OS. They only trust the Chrome OS you sign with your key. And how you can actually build your own over the air update server using all the standard existing tools so that you can actually create new versions of your distro and your Chromebook with your keys will load that new distro over the air. All that stuff is in there. It's all fairly straightforward to do. Chromebooks were designed to do it. You can change the keys infinity times. So give you some numbers. Um, you can change the keys about three times on an Intel processor and you're done. And generally, you can't change them anyway because there are one-time fuses, and you blow those fuses in the Intel CPU, you can no longer change the keys. I mean, actually, in the Intel, the CIO hub. Um, we talk to companies all the time. They have a great security model, or so they tell us. And then we discover, oh, guess what? Uh, those keys, they're burned by the company fuses again. Those fuses are burned by the company that built the system and cannot be changed, or can only be changed once or twice. So when I say Chromebooks, you can change them infinity times. That's actually really what I mean. So there are systems out there that implement the world we want to live in. You know, user control, um, and yet at the same time, extremely secure. You know, as far as I know, nobody's ever broken the Chromebook security. And you know, I realize I work for Google, but um, I was only in Chromebook land two years. I'm just super impressed with the work that the Chromebook people did to really nail security down and get it right. So a lot of material to learn from in Chromebooks about how you do this right. Anybody doing a new system really should study what was done there because the people who did that security were about as good as it gets. Okay, well, I I, uh, I can't believe this is uh, uh, like, I'm, I'm aware of a lot of tech topics here, but it's really shocking to hear um, that uh, um, you seem to say that the level of openness, it's its really limited and like there are Chromebooks out there, there are systems, but uh, you know, its it seems to be limited. And uh, um, like uh, how open um, is 
is how open are things really so um and uh, uh, we need to look more on the level of hardware and firmware and i would like to know uh, from from daniel i know that you are um like opening a lot of devices you you're ordering a lot of boards you 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 you're getting them from everywhere and you try to install different systems on them and and run experiments and all these things could you share a bit about your experience here and tell us how open um, are these uh, uh, systems uh, uh, currently? Um, is the situation really like uh, uh, as bleak as, as, as Ron and Jean-Marie said from your perspective? Um, and uh, yeah, of course, afterwards, right away, the question, what can we do to improve it? But maybe you share first a bit about your experience. Yeah, so I'm on both ends at the same time, right? So. I have a security background. I know lots of security issues and security requirements that different people have or that even I have personally. So a friend of mine, for example, she wanted to uh, set up a motherboard in secure boot mode, uh, deploy to her own keys, and then the machine, well, it started no longer to boot. So it was dead, right? And now she has to contact uh, their support channels and so on. So that's not what we want to have as a user, but of course, a brick is the most secure device that you can have, right? So nobody can run any code on that anymore. So that's for certain. But <laughs> then again, that's not useful. So the question really is, and that's a very, very tough question actually for security people, uh, what is legitimate access, right? So the least thing that people, let's say running uh, a cloud plot, uh, platform I would want to have is servers that can be just compromised from virtual machines. And that is, uh, or has become an attack scenario that they really had to consider. And so, well, vendors developed certain different approaches to tackle this issue. So the thing is, we're talking about lots of layers actually, right? So on the one hand side, uh, you have the hardware itself, then you have multiple uh, chips that are running firmware on top of that. You have operating systems. Well, actually, you have a hypervisor uh, or multiple hypervisors even. You might have multiple oper uh, operating systems running on top of those and then even more layers of virtualization until eventually somebody is running whatever their Kubernetes cluster or, I don't know, storage or whatever applications on top but that's you know where a serious attacker would then need to start and go down the path. But it turns out that uh, with just a few security holds, you can already get there. But that's really, very really hard to prevent then if you don't have any security ready from the ground up. And that's where people started to realize, well, maybe uh, we should lock down uh, the firmware itself then, actually. But then again, of course, the issue is uh, if I, as a regular consumer, or uh, if, if I buy some used hardware, if I want to operate uh, those machines, then I have a very, very different scenario, right? And the more we lock down things, uh, the less accessible they get. So if there is not even a chance to reset something, then this is where it ends. So what Ron just described, if you can only reprovision a CPU or something three times, then, well, that's where it ends, right? So one time you get it, I don't know, you don't get it right, you deploy the wrong keys or something, you lose your keys, and you already lost, like, uh, another chance of the few that you just had. So I really think that this approach that the Chromebooks are having is the right approach for that scenario. And I also think that, well, hardware vendors, which provide uh, cloud infrastructure hardware, they are also sort of on the right track. And now the hard part is sometimes features, and we're really talking about features that were at some point desired, they are falling down from the like large server side of things to the small consumer devices and that's how we end up with devices where you know you want to set up your own secure system and suddenly you have a brick <laughs>
or you can deploy your own firmware because it has the same protection mechanism. And yeah, then again, uh, the best thing I think that we can do is, well, talk about those things, uh, tell people to take things apart and approach vendors, right? So if you have a brick, don't buy a new device, approach your vendor, ask them about the issue, if they can do something about it and tell them that this really is a burden to you, right? So that's what those support channels are for. And I know that uh, also vendors are a bit hard to approach, but you know, do whatever you can. I, I want to throw in, I think Daniel's totally right. I, I do want to mention, I've been, I've been working with one server company for a year, not John Ree's company. They've always been terrific. Um, this company literally, it has taken them about a year to be able to deliver a system to us, which is an evaluation system where we can change the firmware. One year of engineering. So, you know, there's 20 years of effort that's gone in the x86 world, 20 years of work has gone into ensuring that only the manufacturer can change the firmware. And that work has been at every level of the chips. And, and the end result is that even the companies that make these systems, when you ask them for a system that'll let you change the firmware, it's really tough. And they have to, for example, ensure that an IO controller hub from Intel, nobody accidentally burns the fuses on the chip that locks in the key. They have to leave it in what's called manufacturing mode. This changes the process by which they build things, right? They have to essentially divert a thing specially out of their process to make sure that it doesn't go through a process and end up with blown fuses because you can't walk back from that. So it is, you consider literally billions of dollars of work has gone into the model of the manufacturer owns all the security and all the fusing and all this stuff. Walking back out of that cave is going to be a is is going to be tough. And that applies, by the way, that's a problem in Intel x86, AMD x86. It's a problem in parts of the ARM world. I'm very worried that somehow we're going to end up with this being a problem in the RISC V world. It's a real attractive model, right? You you're a manufacturer, you sell someone a piece of hardware you can guarantee to that person that nobody's gonna be able to rewrite the firmware out from under them. That's actually a good property for a lot of people, but it's a bad property for us in the open source community. And that right there is the conflict too, because arguably all this fusing and all this other stuff is good, but it's not good for us in the open source world. So um, I think we also have some questions here already um, about this topic. Um, in um, in the notes and uh, yeah a kind of provocative provocative question do hardware vendors understand that their software is crude and not care or do they generally think they are doing a good job um i think we have to keep in mind that the people who are building this stuff are still human so um, failure is part of the equation so because we are humans. Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing, when I look at what's going on at a company like HPE, um, so we, we are still designing our firmware from scratch, so which is getting pretty uncommon currently. So most of the ODMs are relying on external companies to provide them a firmware stack. But in our cases, we are still designing system firmware. And we, we didn't mention one thing yet, but there are firmware everywhere within the computers. So, and when we speak about firmware, most of the time we think about system firmware or remote management firmware, but there is also firmware embedded um, into microcontrollers, uh, in some cases um, FPGAs or, or PCI Express boards. So all of these firmwares have to talk to each other. And um, if I took the case from HPE, for example, we designed the firmware for the system um, BIOS, for example, and the remote management, but we, we stopped designing it for the PCI Express card. So which means that we have to create interfaces between our own software and um, PCI Express card vendor software to be sure that it works. And even if we are deeply testing these things, um, bugs appears 
And um, they are part of the equations. They are, they are part of the life cycles of the systems. What is really key is not to try to reach a bug-free solution, because I think it's getting impossible with the complexity of the current firmware stacks, even with the open source firmware uh, solutions. But what, what is key is how do you fix the bug? What, what kind of uh, options do you offer to the end user to fix these issues? And um, what we are just trying to do is to provide good support quality. So I know that some people will probably complain about the support quality from OEMs, but this is what OEMs are trying to bring in. And we are trying to support also open source firmware, which are good options for people who are willing to uh, fix bugs by themselves or rely on external people uh, from their uh, hardware vendor to uh, support their software stack. So I think that's that's the beauty of the open source world. But um, uh, that, what is really key to understand is that firmware, when you think about Linux boot, so Linux boot is booting a Linux kernel. So, and if you look at the size of the Linux kernel, this is just a big piece of software and there is bugs. So this happens whenever, whenever we can think. Yeah. And uh, um, we're actually discussing here on several channels at the same time. So uh, uh, Ron just mentioned, I've been told on a modern server in future, there may be several hundred firmware images um, like for different uh, uh, devices, for example, uh, voltage regulators. And Daniel says, uh, yeah, uh, USB-C power delivery requires firmware to negotiate the voltage to supply, for example. Um, and you don't want your charger running as keystroke logger, uh, which you could do now, shockingly. And uh, um, like we are approaching the end of this session and uh, it seems like we are actually only getting started with the topic. But um, um, I think uh, um, this also raises the question um, about uh, uh, what influence can a community or can consumers, can freedom loving people have compared to like, let's say companies, corporations, and we of course know that the world is not black and white. Yeah, but like what influence could different stakeholders um, have here um, when more and more firmware um, uh, components or firmware is running on different components um, of your devices and devices are everywhere, IoT and so on, uh, we just see more and more. So um, how big will be our influence or what can we do? What will companies do? I think there is, there is two things that people can think about. The first thing is what kind of security model do they want to apply to their IT equipment? So do they want to rely on external companies or do they want to be lit up and have the freedom um, to upgrade and manage their own security? It is really, really key to decide that strategy. And, and, um, and, and the second thing is um, um, if you want to use open source firmware, uh, do not hesitate to mention it to your suppliers because I, I know a lot of people who are willing to use open source firmware, but are still shy to request it because they do not think that it could be doable, while it could be for some suppliers. And I think it's really key just to be proud about um, your expectation and just uh, request it. So there's, there's no reason why being shy about, about that demand. And um, if you think that your security model is based on transparency, just claim it and, and ask for it. So, and it's, um, it, that is super important. When I, when I came into HPE, for example, the, the first remark I received was, there's no demand for that, that technology. And part of my job was not to engineer the product, it was just to prove that there was demand. And, and when I started that, that journey, I, I discovered that a lot of our customers were extremely shy about their requirement. And when they are inside the open source firmware community or an open source community, they are really keen to share what they are expecting. But when, when there is a business related relationship, so it's, um, it's more difficult just to, to, to get the insight of the requirements on a general purpose basis. And I think it's super important just to share it with your suppliers, whoever the supplier is. So I'm not speaking for HP only, but I'd be super happy that more different companies adopt this kind of technology because this is the best way to make it grow. Yeah. Okay, so um, I think we covered a, a lot in this session and we are approaching the end. So I would like to um, um, 
yeah, ask you, um, after we learned about the past, we learned uh, about the presence, even though I feel we barely touched the surface of this uh, topic. So the question is, where can uh, people follow up? Where can they learn more about this? I see in the um, notes that people even have very specific technical questions. Um, for example, uh, in, in a Chromebook uh, for end users to change the firmware and so on. So how to do it with motherboard jumpers and so on. I think we we aren't able to cover this completely. I also see Elvin mentioning uh, risk five, which we often discuss in, in our weekly meetings as well. Um, so um, it seems like more and more is going on in regards to open firmware and open hardware. Um, what will you be doing over the next few days and weeks and months? What are your plans personally um, to work now? And uh, where? what do you recommend to people where they can find um, uh, more information? Where can they engage? Um, what should be the next steps from your perspective? And uh, yeah, maybe Daniel, would you like to start? Yeah, one thing uh, that we can already announce. So the open source firmware conference this year uh, will be happening a bit later than usual. That's, uh, you know, because Corona and so on. This year it will be in December. If you go to osfc.io, that's where you will find everything. And if you are even interested in participating and providing some of your ideas, the call for participation is still open. So you can just send in your ideas. Uh, we will be very, very happy to take them. And then again, we have the very, very many projects that we already mentioned. So if you want to learn about Coreboot, for example, you can go to coreboot.org. That's C-O-R-E-B-O-O-T dot org. Uh, likewise, for Linux boot, there is linuxboot.org. And then there is the Euroot project. That's u-root.org. That's already very nice places to get started. And eventually, we also have a Slack team for the open source firmware community. And you will find the links to join that one also on, for example, the Euroad website. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, the moderator just told me we have to end. So um, very brief final state statements, please, from uh, Ron and John marie I'm pretty sure that the open source firmware has a bright future and um, I'm working extremely hard to make it happen on HPE platform currently. Um, the OCP community is trying to get it adopted also on um, ODM's platform. So um, I think we, we just need to make match the, the demand with the supply and, um, and this is how we are going to fix issues. And, um, and we just need to move forward around this. Um, I'm, super optimistic and enjoying working within this uh, space currently. Yeah, I, oh, yeah, so I would say if you like writing programs in Go to run under Linux, if you like hacking on a kernel, or if you would like to join a brand new Rust firmware project, we have help we need at all those levels. And you can really make a big impact on, on the future of this. So. You know, I, I hope we, if we can even get one person watching this to get involved, uh, this has been time well spent for us, I think. Please, if you're interested, let us know. Excellent. Thank you very much. So call to action for everyone. The stakes are pretty big. Thank you very much for joining this session. And uh, we hope to share more about this in future. And thank you to the um, speakers and to Hong Fook making this very beautiful introduction and to everyone at the OSI um, to making this event. So see you at the event furthermore. And uh, yeah, keep in touch, everyone. Let's build a better future. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good day, everybody. Bye. Thanks a lot. Good job. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot, Sean. Bye. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Bye. -bye. How do we leave? <laughs>